And I'm Dr. Ross, and again, welcome everybody to our updates in urologic oncology. Um, you know, it's a pleasure tonight to, to introduce uh, Dr. Amara Sakara. He's an assistant professor of urology at Northwestern, and then he's a clinical focus on men's health, sexual medicine, and reconstructive surgery. He's a director of our Gay and Bisexual Men's Urology Program, which is the nation's first urology clinic targeting the needs of gay and bisexual men. And, we're, and you know, our aspiration with his leadership is to improve the urologic care uh, experience, outcomes, and quality of life for people who are assigned male at birth but identify as gay or bisexual. Tonight, uh, Dr. Amara Sakura is going to talk to us about prostate cancer and gay and bisexual men. Uh, Chana, really a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you very much for being here, and please take it away. Thanks, Dr. Ross, for that great intro kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and I'm very happy to be talking about prostate cancer and gay and bisexual men. Let me, I, I had no disclosures and the three main uh, objectives here are to learn about the, the current clinical terminology used to identify sexual minority patients, uh, the unique impacts of prostate cancer on gay and bisexual men, uh, and then how HIV infection influences prostate cancer screening and treatment. Um, so in terms of an outline, we'll go over some history, some definition, um, talk about healthcare disparities, um, and then dive into prostate cancer and again, bisexual men, prostate cancer and HIV, and then transgender patients and prostate cancer. Um, so, you know, to, to, um, to understand prostate cancer or health disparities in um, LGBT patients, it's important to look at the history of um, LGBT people um, in America. And, um, you know, it wasn't too long ago that um, it, you know, LGBT people weren't all that um, accepted in society. So in 1924, there was the first gay rights organization um, here in Chicago. It was the nation's first one. It was a Society for Human Rights. In 1948, Alfred Kinsey published The Sexual Behavior in the Human, and they, that gave a sort of a spectrum of human sexuality going from one to six um, in terms of where people are. Um, in 1952, the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic Manual um, it listed homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disturbance. In 53, gays weren't able to serve in the federal government because they thought um, they were a security, security risk as they could be blackmailed. Um, in 62, Illinois was the first state um, in the U.S. to decriminalize homosexual acts between consenting adults in private. Um, and in 69, uh, there was a, a riot at um, Stonewall Inn uh, in Greenwich Village in New York City to fight back during a, a police raid. And here's a newspaper uh, clipping from that time, which is a real headline, which is quite sensational. Um, in 1973, the APA removed homosexuality from the DSM. In 81, um, unfortunately, there was an uh, unusual cluster of PCP and five gay men, and this was the start of recognizing the AIDS epidemic. Um, it took four years and hundreds of thousands of lives for the president of the United States to publicly acknowledge AIDS, and that was in 85. Um, in 1993, there was the don't ask, don't tell policy, which permitted gays to serve in the military, um, but it banned homosexual activity. In 1996, uh, DOMA was enact enacted and that banned federal recognition of same-sex marriage. But then things started to change uh, pretty quickly after that point. In, in 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in uh, Lawrence versus Texas that sodomy laws in the U.S. are unconstitutional. In 2004, Massachusetts became the first state um, to legalize same-sex unions. Um, but it wasn't until 2015 that the, the Supreme Court um, ruled that same-sex couples um, could marry. And then in 2018, you have the first openly gay governor um, that, who was elected in Colorado. In 2020, you have um, equal protections um, under federal law um, in terms of uh, protections against workplace discrimination. In 2021, we have Pete Buttigieg, um, who's the Secretary of, of Transportation, and he's the first openly gay member of the cabinet. And in 2021, you also have the first um, openly gay active NFL player. Um, but it hasn't always been um, progress forward, particularly in the last, you know, five years. Uh, there was initially a transgender military ban, which has since been overturned, thankfully. Um, and then during the time of Trump's um, election, uh, there was an increase in uh, crisis support line calls by LGBT people. And in this particular law, giving uh, healthcare workers new religious liberty protections was enacted. Um, and, and there was some concern that this may um, um, give people cover uh, for discrimination in terms of healthcare providers. 
When you're talking about the gay community, there's a, a lot of diversity among gay and bisexual men by r- age, race, education, income, family structures, uh, family structure, lifestyle choices, self-expression, and their degree of outness. So they're not, you know, one uh, uniform um, group. And uh, it's important to note that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same. Um, all people have a sexual orientation and a gender identity. Um, it, and how people identify can change over time and the terminology varies. So when you think about sexual orientation, it's how a person identifies their physical and emotional attraction, attraction to others. And it, it consists of desire, um, behavior. There are men who have sex with men and women who have sex with women um, and identity. So do they identify as straight, gay, bisexual, um, lesbian, queer, or something else completely? In terms of gender identity, um, it's a person's internal sense of their gender. So do I consider myself male, female, both, neither, um, and all people have a gender identity. Um, Gender expression, on the other hand, is how one presents oneself by behavior, mannerisms, speech patterns, dress, hairstyle, um, and it may be on a spectrum. Transgender um, uh, is when gender identity or expression is not congruent with um, sex assigned at birth. Um, and in terms of terminology, there's a transgender woman, trans woman, male to female, transgender man, trans man, female to male, and non-binary or gender queer. Um, so there's many reasons why there's uh, poor health co- outcomes in um, LGBT patients, and there's this model that explains why uh, they might have poorer outcomes, and that relates to different types of stigma. So interpersonal stigma like societal homophobia, family rejection, peer harassment intrapersonal uh, or structural stigma, which is where we fit in, uh, where there's homophobia within healthcare, educational setting, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, religious exclusion, and this can lead to intrapersonal stigma where there's internalized homophobia, low self-esteem, depression, self-harm, self-validation through sex, all of which can lead to stress, anxiety, depression, and healthcare disparities. Um, There's um, some degree of literature uh, documenting negative interactions in healthcare settings for LGBT patients. So they um, um, cite prejudice, assumptions, a lack of sensitive or knowledgeable providers, and few support groups um, and inclusive information. Um, because of the disparities in healthcare, the Institute of Medicine in 2011 um, uh, started um, to address this. So there's a building a better foundation for better understanding um, where they wanted to collect um, data on sexual orientation in the me- in the health record. Um, and that was also again um, in 2013 they reiterated this. The Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion um, in 2020 they, they had the Healthy People 2020 initiative and um, the reason they did this was because they, they found that um, LGBT youth were two or three, three times more likely to attempt suicide. They're more likely to be homeless. Um, they found that MSM or men who have sex with men are at higher risk for HIV, STDs, especially among communities of color. Um, and LGBT populations have the highest rates of tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use. Um, and they also found that lesbians are less likely to access um, screening services. As a result, there's a, a variety of um, health outcomes that are poor for LGBT patients, um, and they have to do with, you know, regular chronic di- conditions like hypertension and heart disease, but also um, uh, things that have to do with health risk behaviors like drinking, smoking, um, and mental health issues. Um, so one of the other reasons LGBT patients have uh, poor health outcomes is because physicians may not always be comfortable with LGBT patients. Fortunately, this has changed over time. So in 1982, there was a survey of San Diego County Medical Society's physicians, and this was repeated in 1999 and 2017. Um, And what they found was in 1982, um, 30% of of people who were polled said they would not admit a highly qualified gay applicant to medical school, whereas currently, or in 2017, that was 0.4%, so a huge change there. Um, And in 1982, they wouldn't refer a child to a gay pediatrician, and 46% of people said that, or physicians said that, and that's now uh, much lower at 3%. Um, however, there's still a great deal of stigma around HIV infection, so about 27% of, of uh, physicians would not refer um, to a HIV-positive general surgeon. What they found was more, more recent graduates were less likely to be homophobic and HIV-phobic, and homophobia was correlated with the fear of HIV-infected uh, people. 
So we talked about 2020, uh, Healthy People 2020. There's 2020 has now come and gone, um, and there's been some progress, but there's still a lot uh, to be done. So there's Healthy People 2030, which is the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion's goals for um, LGBT health. And these are a little more specific. So they, they'd like to reduce bullying of LGBT students, reduce drug and alcohol abuse, suicidal thoughts in LGBT high school students, increase national surveys that collect data on LGBT populations, increase the number of states and territories that in include um, sexual orientation, gender identity data in the uh, behavioral risk factor surveillance system, and reduce the rates of STIs and HIV and LGBT people. So one of the, the, the easiest ways to get information about um, your patient's sexual orientation is just, just to include it with the demographic uh, form at the start of the clinic appointment. Um, this way, um, patients are able to disclose who they are before they're even um, talking to you, and it can make the conversation much easier when they see you. Uh, because it can be you know, pretty difficult to discuss uh, issues of intimacy during a, a clinical encounter. Um, but taking a sexual history um, for urologists is very important. Um, the core comprehensive history for LGBT patients is the same um, as for all other patients, um, just keeping in mind unique health risks and issues for LGBT populations. Um, and you, know, you should get to know your patient as a person, use inclusive, inclusive and neutral language, and for all patients, just make it routine, make no assumptions, and assure confidentiality. Um, one of the pitfalls of, of talking to patients who are LGBT is you, you may, um, they may prefer a different pronoun than the one you're used to um, using. So it's important to use uh, the patient's preferred name and pronouns. Uh, for example, most transgender women want you to say she or her when talking about them. Trans men generally prefer he or his. Um, some people may use words or pronouns that are unfamiliar. Um, pronouns such as Z or they are sometimes used by people who don't identify um, with the gender binary, binary of she and he. Um, and then there's other terminology that um, that is a, a little different from what it was traditionally. So queer was traditionally an insult, but some people, especially young people, use this term with pride to identify their sexual orientation as non-heterosexual. And then there's gender queer or gender fluid used by um, some people to describe their gender identity and, and expression as both male, female, or neither male nor female. Um, and it's also described as rejecting the gender binary. And some people don't like labels at all. Um, in terms of terms that are outdated, um, homosexual is currently outdated. Um, people prefer gay, lesbian, bisexual, or, or, or LGBT. Um, transvestite or transgendered is outdated, it's transgender. Um, sexual preference or lifestyle choice is also out of date, um, and sexual orientation is what's preferred. Um, so there are you know, obvious don'ts, which include using disrespectful language, gossiping about a patient's appearance or behavior, saying things about someone that are not necessary for their care, um, and then just sticking to asking questions related to a patient's healthcare and not just to satisfy your own curiosity. So in terms of cancer in this population, um, the rates of cancer, gay men are about two times more likely to have a cancer diagnosis. And this was um, obtained through the California Health Interview Survey uh, data, which um, uh, had information about 50,000 respondents, 1,500 of whom were gay or bisexual males. Um, there was more head and neck cancers in men who have sex um, with men who had oral sex. And there were higher rates of anal cancer in men who have sex with men um, who had anal sex. Um, the higher rates of cancer, however, may be explained by more AIDS-defining cancers like Posty sarcoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in this group, and also more cancers associated with HIV, such as anal and lung cancer and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, in terms of prostate cancer in gay and bisexual men, this is a, a new area of research, and you can start seeing the first papers um, kind of trickle in about uh, the turn of um, the, the, the century, uh, the year 2000 or so. Um, the entire literature is about, you know, a little bit over 100 papers. They're mostly qualitative uh, data or case reports. Um, and that a large part of that is because data on sexual orientation is not captured routinely in cancer registries. So there's not um, great, you know, population level databases with sexual orientation as a, um, um, a field, or traditionally there has not been. Um, in terms of PSA screening and prostate cancer, um, in a large study using NHIS uh, data um, with 22,000 uh, men, 574 of whom were MSM, there were no differences in PSA screening rates between gay, bisexual, and straight men um, in 2018. 
Uh, prior to this, gay men screen, actually screened at higher rates with an odds ratio of 1.5. Um, however, it's a slightly different story for African-American gay men. Um, they're about 14% less likely to have a PSA compared to their African-American heterosexual counterparts and 28% less likely to test than gay white men. Um, in terms of um, another uh, data set, there's a SEER cancer registry data from Washington State, and they found no change in uh, prostate cancer risk by sexual orientation, history of male partners, or anal sex, or a history of anal sex. In terms of um, you know, how gay men and bisexual men choose to be treated for prostate cancer, um, there are similar rates of treatment uh, between heterosexual men and, and gay men. Um, so in this particular study, looking at 460 heterosexual men and 92 gay men, um, they found that about 80 to 85% of people went, um, underwent surgery for treatment and about 26 to 28% uh, underwent um, radiation. Um, because the side effects from surgery and radiation can be different um, for gay men compared to, to um, straight men, there are some who advocate asking patients about their role in sex to assist with treatment choice. Um, so if they are receptive partners, um, there's some thought that surgery might be better because um, radiation can cause some rectal fibrosis when it comes to um, being the receptive partner. Um, and then if they're the inserted partner, uh, radiation might be a better choice because uh, erectile function is most important there and there's not such a um, uh, emphasis on rectal health. Um, but discussing the risks and benefits uh, of both are appropriate if they practice both um, types of intercourse. Um, despite these recommendations, you know, there's really no long-term differences in erectile function and bowel urgency between men getting um, radiation um, or surgery. Um, in terms of health-related quality of life, um, overall, gay prostate cancer patients experience um, lower health-related quality of life. Um, there's a study in 2016 looking at 124 gay and bisexual men and 225 heterosexual men. And gay and bisexual men scored lower on the FACP um, and had greater degree of psychological di uh, distress, so greater degrees of anxiety, panic, depression, um, and this was thought to be due to a, a, a greater degree of bother from side effects, um, a fear of recurrence, and um, just generally lower satisfaction with care. But the extent to which um, the lower health-related quality of life uh, is from prostate cancer is unclear just because skin bisexual men have greater levels of depression and psychological distress at baseline even without a cancer diagnosis. Um, in terms of erectile dysfunction, so in the same study, um, the um, erectile function score for gay men um, was actually better um, than for straight men. So they had an epic of, um, the, uh, straight men had an epic of 21 versus, um, sorry, gay men had an epic of 21 versus 16. Um, um, and then in tr there was a, a different study that looked at 89 gay and bisexual men and compared to published population norms, and they found um, uh, an epic score of 38 versus 29, um, which was statistically significant there. In terms of bother from erectile dysfunction, um, there were higher levels of bother seen in men who have sex with men, um, about 81% in a study by Usher. And this might be due to expectations of having an active sex life well into their later years. Um, it could also be a loss of opportunity to explore recently accepted sexuality, particularly for men who came of age, um, men who are older, who came of age, who came, who came to terms with their sexuality much later in life. Um, and there's some data that gay men are more sexually active, more likely to be non-monogamous. Um, in a survey of 1,000 gay and 2,000 straight men um, in 2011, 56 to 61 percent of gay men were noted to have sex outside of their relationships versus 10 to 15 of straight men. Um, and it could also be that firmer erections are needed for anal intercourse compared to vaginal sex. So uh, um, having a, a certain degree of erectile dysfunction may make it impossible to have anal sex where you could potentially have vaginal sex with the same degree of erectile dysfunction. Um, in terms of ejaculatory function and bother, um, gay men consistently report poor ejaculatory function after prostate cancer. Um, they also display more bother with loss of ejaculatory function. 
Um, and ejaculatory bother may be greater due to HIV prevention campaigns. Um, so these targeted at you know, drawing attention to the management of ejaculation during the height of the HIV epidemic. Um, and more gay men feel that uh, ejaculate serves as visual evidence of satisfaction or a sign of good sex. Um, when it comes to changes in role in sex, um, as we you know, sort of alluded to before, treatment can lead to changes in sexual um, roles. So um, if they're the inserted partner or the receptive partner, things can change because of treatment. So there's a study, um, again, looking at roles pre-treatment. And in this particular study, 31% of partners were the inserted partners before treatment, 19 were receptive and 20% were versatile. Um, and then post-treatment, 12% were inserted or tops, and 24% were receptive or bottoms, and 8% were versatile. So there was a change with treatment. Um, and changes can lead to a, a changes in role in sex can lead to a loss of sexual identity. Um, so what they found was inserted partners didn't want to switch because they perceived um, being the receptive partner as a submissive role or they didn't want to switch because they didn't find the new position pleasurable, or they were in relationships with partners who were exclusively interested in one role, so it didn't make sense for them to switch. Um, but, you know, switching roles is not universally viewed as negative. Repositioning does allow for sexual engagement after treatment, and some of the, the participants of the study noted this as well. Um, when it comes to measuring sexual function in men who have sex with men, um, Instruments measuring sexual function or erectile function were validated mostly in straight cohorts. So when it came to EPIC, all men were presumed to be straight. And when it came, it came to the MSHQ, there was a small uh, proportion of participants who were MSM. Um, so this has led to the development of other uh, measure, measuring devices or measuring instruments. Um, there's the IIEF MSM, which is modified um, for MSM. Um, but despite modifications, there's really no instruments that currently exist to measure um, sexual function for receptive partners. Um, and or it, there's really no way to measure sexual pleasure for receptive partners. And that pleasure is likely multifactorial. There, there's the pudendal nerve for um, anal stimulation. There's the pelvic nerves and hypogastric nerves. It's unclear how uh, prostatectomy or radiation impacts this function, and there's just currently no way to track um, changes of function after treatment. Um, so when it comes to special considerations, things we don't often think about um, when it comes to prostate cancer treatment for our patients. Um, there's a study that uh, came out of MSK um, looking at radiation doses from brachytherapy with two types of seeds, so iodine-125 or palladium-103. We typically think about asking people to refrain from spooning or, or having children on their laps or, you know, refraining from close contact. But when you think about the mechanics of, um, of sex for, for these men, um, there's potentially um, a chance for the top partner or the inserted partner to have radiation exposure during intercourse. So they, they looked at different types of exposure and how much radiation they got with each kind of seed. Um, so in, uh, in total, they had 120 patients, 20 were treated with iodine, 34 were treated with palladium, and then 48 got palladium with uh, XRT combo. Um, and the reason this is interesting is because iodine has a half-life of about 60 days and palladium has a half-life of 17 days, which is much shorter. Um, they calculated a penile tissue radiation dose limit um, to be 2 uh, centigrade, um, and they did that by you know, waiting for gonadal tissue um, based on the whole body dose. What they found was um, if you used uh, palladium, uh, the waiting time to resume um, anal intercourse was two months, whereas if you use iodine, it should be about six months to get out of, you know, what's considered dangerous. Um, so this particular group recommended um, palladium for sexually active gay and bisexual men engaging in receptive anal intercourse. Um, when it comes to, you know, the surgical um, side of treatment, um, often a question that gets asked is when can receptive anal intercourse be resumed after surgery? There's not any data, um, you know, or sur surrounding this, but we did um, question or we did send a survey out to academic urologists asking them um, when they thought it might be safe. 
And the majority of surgeons thought four to six uh, weeks or six to eight weeks um, would be um, a safe time to resume receptive anal intercourse for men after surgery. Um, now, getting to prostate cancer in uh, men with HIV. Um, uh, MS, as as we you probably know, MS, MSM are disproportionately affected. Seventy five, sorry, sixty seven percent of new infections um, are men who have sex with men. Um, but the the relative risk of developing prostate cancer in uh, men with HIV uh, is 0.7, so it's slightly lower than for people without HIV. Um, and the reason for this is potentially because the AIDS epidemic wiped out a whole generation of men who would otherwise have prostate cancer if they were alive. Um, so there's just not as many um, men who are gay and have um, prostate cancer just because they died with um, AIDS in the 80s. Um, there's also the possibility there's, that there's decreased rates of screening in HIV positive patients. Um, so there's um, studies looking at rates of screening and it's 18% of HIV positive patients versus 57% of the general population over 50. Um, and then protease inhibitors have shown some anti-neoplastic effect on some cancers, including prostate cancer, but this is just uh, um, in the lab. Um, there appears to be no benefit to screening HIV infected men at an earlier age. And there's no effect of um, HIV on PSA levels. Um, when it comes to treatment uh, outcomes in HIV infected men, um, there's a study linking cancer registries and HIV AIDS registries, and there's over or close to 2 million patients in this um, particular study. Um, and 6,500 6, of them were HIV infected. What they found was prostate cancer um, specific mortality was higher uh, in HIV infected patients with a hazard ratio of 1.57. But when you adjusted for treatment, um, the hazard ratio became non-significant. Um, and what that suggests is disparities in receiving cancer treatment plays a role here. Um, so uh, HIV infected men are less likely to receive treatment with an odds ratio of 1.8. Um, and people with lower CD4 counts, African American men with HIV, people who contracted HIV from IV drug use and HIV infected people who are 45 to 64 had a lower um, uh, rate of treatment is what the study found. Um, and what they all found, what a different study found was that HIV infected men are more likely to receive radiation and less likely to get surgery. Um, and the reason they thought this was true was because um, they thought that surgeons generally were uncomfortable operating on HIV infected uh, patients at this particular time when this study was done. Um, at least that's how they explain this. Um, and so HIV infected patients were referred to radiation more often. Um, in terms of treatment responses and side, and side effects for HIV patients, um, there's a similar therapeutic benefit to treatment, um, similar rates of disease-free survival when stratified by treatment. Uh, there's no increase in opportunistic infections in HIV infected men status post surgery. Um, and then external beam radiation um, leads to decreased CD4 counts, but it recovers to baseline in, in two to four years. Um, moving on to prostate cancer in transgender patients. Um, so, you know, prostate cancer in transgender women, um, the transgender women who choose to have gender affirming hormone therapy, their body is deprived of androgens and they're supplemented with estrogens. Um, the reported numbers of prostate cancer cases um, are very small. There, there are about 12 case reports and about 60% of, um, of these women present with uh, metastatic disease. Um, Gurin studied uh, 2300 transgender women and the prevalence here was 0.04 percent so it was uh, very low um, and then given the um, low testosterone environment a PSA of four doesn't often make sense for these women so um, there's no great data behind this but they were recommending a PSA cutoff of one um, to trigger a biopsy 
Um, so, you know, we talked about this paper, are physicians comfortable with um, LGBT patients and colleagues? This was you know, obviously done among all kinds of physicians and not urologists. So what our group did was we um, sent a um, survey to 154 academic urologists in uh, 2019, and we asked them, you know, do you think gay and bisexual patients have different health concerns concerning prostate cancer than straight patients? And about half of them said, yeah, the concerns are probably similar. And um, about half said there are probably unique differences in how gay and bisexual men and straight men experience prostate cancer. Um, and then we asked a series of questions. So these are all um, questions where the answer is true uh, based on current data. And we, were at, we asked them to give us a true-false response. Um, so when asked if gay men show more bother with anti-ejaculation than straight men, only about 21% got that right. Um, when asked um, if gay men were at increased rest, risk for uh, anal cancer, 65% of, of uh, respondents got that right. And um, LGBT patients may avoid accessing healthcare due to difficulty communicating with providers, 61% of uh, urologists responding got that correct as well. Um, when we asked these uh, providers if they felt comfortable discussing sexual health with, uh, with patients, um, equally, they were equally comfortable discussing sexual health concerns with straight and gay patients. Um, and when it came to the amount of time they got um, in you know, formal education on LGBT health, the majority of respondents had um, less than five hours of formal education in LGBT health. Um, but a lot of these uh, physicians did say that they would like more educational events through professional organizations, organizations about LGBT health needs. So as a result of all of this, um, um, this led to the creation of the Gay and Bisexual Men's Urology Program here at Northwestern. So the idea was conceived in 2018 um, by Dr. Schaefer after there was preliminary research um, showing disparities in LGBT patients. And the vision here was to partner with primary care doctors, social workers, um, sex therapists within the NM system and provide LGBTQ affirming um, culturally appropriate urologic care. We also wanted to obtain data on urologic healthcare needs of gay and bisexual men and then create a blueprint to set something up, um, something similar um, across um, the country. Um, so the clinic is structured, um, you know, we have clinics at, at Galter on the 20th floor where there's a social worker on site. Um, here we do clinic and procedural visits and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays we see patients in, in North Halstead uh, where we partner with uh, 17 PCPs um, where, and their patient panels are enriched in LGBT patients. Um, they, um, we also partner with sex therapists within the NM system as well as LGBT focused therapists in the community, particularly in the North Halstead area. When we started, we, um, we needed to get the word out, so we had a, a, some media um, um, advertising through Facebook, um, which led to our landing page um, where people could come in and see how um, healthcare would be different. There were some videos um, for them explaining the screenings and screening. Um, and then there was a New York Times article recently that um, gave prostate cancer in um, LGBT patients or in gay bisexual men um, more of a spotlight. Um, and that's increased the, the traffic to the clinic. Um, so there's more, uh, more awareness about different health needs for this population. Um, so our, you know, our plan is to, to, to uh, collaborate more with other departments and kind of build on this um, program and, and create um, uh, more of a research infrastructure to collect data on um, gay and bisexual men, women, men with prostate cancer. Um, so in summary, you know, rates of screening for prostate cancer are similar between, between gay and bisexual men and straight men. Um, there's lower health related quality of life um, when you look at gay and bisexual men compared to um, straight men. There are lower rates of ED, but higher rates of bother from ED and ejaculatory dysfunction. Um, treatment can lead to changes in role in sexual identity, um, and the tools to measure sexual function are sometimes inadequate. Um, and there's differences in counseling for brachytherapy patients regarding radiation, um, safety especially um, important in men engaging in anal intercourse. Um, patients with HIV have um, worse outcomes when diagnosed with prostate, prostate cancer, but it, it, if they're treated appropriately, that appears to disappear. 
Um, trans women are also affected by prostate cancer and a PSA cutoff of one is recommended. Um, and then more education is desired by healthcare, healthcare providers. Um, so that's, that's um, it for right now. I'm happy to take any questions. Chana, that was a spectacular presentation. Um, and just so much, um, you know, uh, so much to unpack. I mean, there's just so many unknown unknowns. And um, what uh, are you most passionate about right now? Like, where are you really want to dive in and 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 kind of first get in the deep end? What what areas are you going to focus on? Let's just say in the first six or twelve months, for your you know kind of building out the program. Yeah, I think the most uh, important to me is to collect data on these patients. Um, so without data, it's hard to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, so it's to create like a a way to get to to track the patients that come in and see what they're coming in for and um, how they're doing after treatment and how they experience treatment maybe differently than other people. And part of that is creating a uh, a tool to measure sexual function a little more completely. So if you look at sexual function just in the form of erectile function, that doesn't seem to work for this population. So there's got to be a, a validated or different questionnaire for gay men that includes both anal dyspareunia or pain with anal intercourse and pleasure um, and, and to to help track progress for people that have you know, non-vaginal sex over time. We've talked about that and to formally do that requires some time and effort, but uh, you're we're going to also just propose your own questionnaire, right? And then we right. can think about validating that secondarily, because I think that would probably be helpful when you're just wanting to collect the data, right? Because then you'll right. just get a landscape of like, well, what do people like and how does it affect them or influence them, right? Right. Hi, Chana. This is Brittany. I'm the genetic counselor with the department. I don't know if you've had the pleasure of meeting yet, um, but thank you so much for this talk. I it got me thinking about uh, a trans woman that I met with who actually had a known BRCA mutation in the family. So I was meeting with her for um, risk assessment and to do testing. And there's just such limited data in the, in the trans community about like hereditary cancer, about cancer screening and, and risk for these different cancers. And I would just love to hear if you've had any experience with this in your clinic or if this is, something that you've like thought about exploring with your clinic? No, absolutely. It's nice to nice to meet you, Brittany. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've thought about the best way to, to screen these patients and with a rate of prostate cancer of 0.04, um, at least in like the studies that exist, um, it's a matter of, you know, how aggressively you want to screen these people. Um, it, when, when it comes to like, it's really hard to uh, to remember to screen for prostate cancer in trans women sometimes just because you forget that they have a, a, a prostate. Um, so in terms of like, you know, screening for for like BRCA mutations, I've, I haven't seen any patients with like a, a BRCA mutation, but I just you know, make it a point to screen with a PSA for every trans woman um, that comes to my office if they're over the age of like 55, uh, just to get a sense of what their baseline is and, and kind of track that over time. Even though the like the, the data shows like a 0.04 rate of, of cancer, like this population isn't well tracked within population registries. So I'm not sure we can sort of hang our hat on that number. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's a real number. Yeah, and I think too, it's a great question. And there's a lot, again, lots to unpack. You know, the variables in, in those scenarios are you know when what when were the hormones initiated i.e the age of the individual um because you know um there's a correlation between dna damage and testosterone levels in the prostate so one could hypothesize or surmise if you're talking about someone who uh, initiated you know hormonal therapy uh hormones i should say um, at an early age that their lifetime risk of prostate cancer would probably be different than somebody who maybe has a, a focus of cancer 
because they initiated hormone therapy at age 60 or 55 and that 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 nidus could then become castrate resistant because obviously early prostate cancer was treated by uh by dr huggins with estrogen right so so there's a lot a lot of things to kind of unpack it's a pretty cool thought of course i'm sure you told her Brittany, that she needs to be screened for prostate uh, for breast cancer because that she'll still have mammary tissue and that certainly is be important um but yeah. you know as a, as a follow-up to, to this jana you know you're you're there's already a million things to do when we first met about this you laid out what you wanted to do in your one year of research with us with dr kundu and i told you well that was a that was a career's worth of work so you've just again highlighted that you have a career's worth worth of work to do here which is great um the other thing to think about is if you can find an interested engaged enthusiastic medical oncologist i guarantee you that there's going to be a lot of issues that need to be addressed in uh, gay and bisexual men who have advanced prostate cancer and are on systemic therapy. Um, Health-related quality of life is, you know, measures and, um, and you know, appropriate uh, measures of them that may be unique to gay and bisexual men are, are, I'm sure, are absent, right? Because they don't, you know, it's just a even smaller en- entity. Absolutely, yeah. I'd have to say just my experience with those patients in clinic, um, it seems to be very different for gay and bisexual men compared to the straight, my, like the straight patients that come see me with you know, metastatic prostate cancer who are on, you know, some kind of systemic therapy. Um, it seems to bother gay and bisexual men a lot more. But um, it'd be oh, interesting. Yeah. To see. I mean, it's a good question. I mean, there is good data about how much it bothers most straight men, but how it bothers them and 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 so forth may be different. I mean, it's pretty, uh, you know, a, it's pretty brutal treatment. Of course, it's designed to prolong life, but another opportunity. And, you know, I bet you that there'd be some, there's someone out there who'd be interested in partnering with you on it, you know? Well, that's great. And I think, I think Chana, you did talk about this maybe briefly, but, you know, Chana um, um, has, for the ones of you there at Northwestern, Dr. Uh, Amar Zakara has developed some content <clears throat> like for the discharge instructions, patient information handouts um, that are, um, you know, specific for the um, um, gay and bisexual um, male community. And that's been helpful in my practice. Uh, a lot of the other material that I have been using, uh, I didn't realize how heteronormative it was. So that's very widely available. And, um, uh, and if, you, um, if, you, if you need that or need to know where to find it, you can ask uh, me and my staff or, or Dr. Uh, uh, Amara Sikara's staff as well. Um, and thanks again. It's a great presentation. Thanks, Dr. Ross. Great being here.